Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming and um, giving up your your weekend to listen to a little bit of cosmochemistry and one or two other points. Um, and what uh, Corinna and Paul asked me to do was to talk around the topic of we are startup. So there we go. Um, and some of the things that we might be able to deduce from this. Uh, in terms of, if you like, natural laws that emerge out of thinking about this, and also um, <coughs> laws that then may have some application and relevance in looking at society, history, and so on. So, a book that I think is very well worth reading is this one here, which is by Martin Rees, who's currently the Astronomer Royal, on just six numbers. And one of the things that Martin Rees points out is that the kind of universe we live in depends fundamentally, in a physical way, anyway, on six numbers, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them that he points up is this number 10 to the 36, which is a billion, 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 billion. Um, and that is the ratio between how strong electric charges either attract one another or repel one another, which is very, very strong. Um, although not the strongest uh, force that we know in nature, and the force of gravity. And so if you read Martin Rees's book, he says that if this number had been larger, then basically stars, galaxies would never have been able to form because gravity would have been too weak to pull stuff together. And I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But if it had been a smaller number, so if gravity had been much smaller, that would have meant that the universe would have been extremely short-lived, stars would have formed very rapidly, burnt themselves out, and perhaps you would not have had opportunities for life to evolve. And Martin Rees's book leads into something that you can call the anthropic principle. And there is a strong version of the anthropic principle that I think is very much tied up with kind of religious notions of the centrality of humans and a weak version. So if we take the strong version of the anthropic principle, the fact that these six numbers have the values, and we can measure them now very precisely, so the fact that these six numbers that Martin Rees um, pulls out as being significant numbers in the way our universe is and evolves, the fact that they have the particular values that they do is because some kind of divine superpower has intervened to set up a universe just for us. So that is called the strong and profit principle. Well, I'm kind of starting with the fact that we exist. And how do we understand the fact that we exist and we all do exist in this room? So that, to me, is a way of looking at the world that is incredibly human-centric and uh, possibly even incredibly individually-centric. And if you think about it, um, there, you know, some of you may have popped in and had a cup of coffee this morning. Hopefully not in Starbucks, but in some uh, more friendly enterprise. And if you took the strong anthropic principle to its very limit, you would have to conclude that actually our forefathers fighting in the English Civil War to break the power of the monarchy and to release, if you like, the um, 
developments in society that gave rise to modern capitalism, etc., etc., that they somehow were all working just so that we could exist and have a cup of coffee in Starbucks and we almost as individuals. <coughs> but this is a quote from um, uh, Marx's, um, it's a book called The Eighteenth Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, which is about the revolutions going on in the 1840s that really radicalized the whole section of intelligentsia, including people like Marx and what were called the young Hegelians um, at the time. And he said, people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selecting circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. So from my point of view, the problem with, in social terms, having a strong anthropic principle is it means that somehow everything's been set up just for us. But actually, what we see is that we do make our own history, but under conditions that have historically been set up for us. So the historic importance of the English Civil War in the 1640s and the Commonwealth of the 1650s, the historic importance of the French Revolution, the historic importance of the uh, Russian Revolution, social movements throughout the, um, the periods of human history give rise to the world that we see today, but it wasn't all set up just so that we would be where we are. And if we don't think that is true of social history, if nobody's going to in this room claim that Oliver Cromwell carried out his revolution simply so that Starbucks could serve us coffee on a Saturday morning, if we don't actually draw that conclusion, then why should we then think that the universe as a whole has been set up with these perfectly tuned just six numbers simply so that we can exist? So what I'm making here is an argument against some kind of supernatural and divine intervention. Because what I want to do is to draw out the idea that laws come naturally out of the universe, out of the world in which we exist, that we can know about, that we can draw lessons from, and that although they're in no way going to be the same laws that give rise to social and historical and economic movements, nonetheless that you can get an idea that we live in some kind of a law-governed universe. So the weak anthropic principle says that instead of being the purpose of the universe, we're part of the evidence for the kind of universe in which we live. So we, sitting around in this room, the fact that we exist, we can draw some conclusions from the fact that we exist, that we can then use to understand the, um, the universe around us. So we are carbon-based life forms. Um, so carbon must exist and that is not so trivial as you might think and how carbon exists is something we only got to learn in the uh, in the 1950s so we haven't known how carbon could exist for all that long you know so um, quite a few of us were actually alive and doing things in, in the 1950s um, we are products of an <coughs> evolutionary history, the evolution of life on Earth. Um, that says something about stability. There are lots of universes you could think of that which would be incredibly unstable. But under those conditions, you wouldn't have long enough for life to evolve, and I'll say a bit more about that. And we are conscious beings, so in the fabric of the universe, there must be the potential for consciousness to arise. And so we must be able to understand how consciousness arises and how consciousness also um, is, uh, uh, you know, can understand the world and can perhaps even transform the world, as Paul has indicated. 
So this weak anthropic principle gives rise to the notion of a law-governed universe. If there weren't laws in the universe that had the potential for organizing the universe in such a way that we could exist, we couldn't exist. So we take that as being part of the evidence, that we live in a universe that has regularities in it, regularities in it that we can understand and understand how we come about. So I'm just going to take you through a bit of um, the history and development of science and why we've got certain views of the world in which we now exist that we didn't have previously. So the Greeks are always credited with um, being the, uh, the civilization that, if you like, really invented science. Prior to the Greeks, you had civilizations like the Babylonians and the Sumerians and before them. And they were incredibly good at cataloging and logging things. There's an argument that says that the very earliest forms of writing came into existence so that people could catalog and log things, particularly, you know, trade transactions and that having a way of understanding how much brain you had exchanged for this cow required you somehow to make a note and so you would need to have some kind of a pictogram of a cow and a pictogram of brain and you would have to be equivalencing them somehow and this gave rise gave rise to writing and the kind of understanding that you get from, say, the Sumerians, two to three thousand years BC, then the Babylonians, is a catalogue. And they were incredibly good at uh, what I would call a strong astronometry. That is that they were very good at cataloguing where things were in the heavens and even making predictions on things like eclipses, using stars, etc., to predict when would be a good time to sow crops, when would be a good time to harvest, and drawing up a notion of a calendar based on astronomical uh, observations. But you could argue that they never went beyond using these observations as a way of cataloging and regularizing the world to think about why it was that Orion should come up in the sky in the autumn and uh, winter months in the northern hemisphere. What it was that was causing these regularities, these patterns to occur, or why it was that planets, which they knew about, some of the planets in the bigger, uh, the ones that appear brighter in their sky, why it was they did these kinds of things. So they never developed what my colleagues would call a cosmogony, which is what the universe actually is, type of theory. They just were very good at cataloguing how it worked. And the Greeks were the first ones to start thinking about why the universe was like it is. So Thales of Miletus in the late 6th century BC came up with the notion that the universe, the world, the cosmos was water. And that's not such a stupid idea because we know water can exist as ice and that's a solid. Water can exist as a liquid and we know about liquids. And water can exist as steam, as a gas. So it seemed to him that, you know, in various forms, the universe would be water. And you would be seeing the universe in various forms and changes in the forms of water giving rise to solid, liquid and gas that we think of today. And then um, another uh, Greek philosopher, a bit later, um, came up with the idea that everything was fire. And what was interesting about Greek philosophy was that they, they had this notion that if Thales said everything was water, and I think it was Anaximander said everything was fire, they couldn't both be right, that they were competing theories. They weren't just alternative ways of looking at the world, they were actually competing theories. And so out of that, you get the notion that scientific theories compete with one another. If this is right, that's got to be wrong. And this is how we make progress. So if we've got a scientific theory, 
we make progress by doing experiments to test it out. And if it turns out that a test shows that this theory or that theory is wrong, then we have to sort of look to alternative theories. So this was a, a different way of thinking from what had come before. And we owe an awful lot to the Greeks, but um, in particular, uh, Aristotle probably did most in terms of um, categorizing uh, the way in which Greek, in inverted commas, scientific thought, because it wasn't fabulously experimental in his work. And he had a notion of uh, natural tendencies. So earthy things fall to earth, because that's where they want to be, naturally liquidy things flow into the ocean because that's where they want to be naturally so rivers flow into the ocean because that's where they naturally want to be and gassy things go up into the atmosphere because that's naturally where they want to be and fiery things um, do fiery fiery things because the realm of the fire up in the up in the heavens is where they naturally want to be so this notion of natural tendencies and that kind of explained things for, I don't know, uh, well over 1,500 years, probably nearer, nearer 2,000 years. That was the prevailing philosophy until we come to the 16th century, the notion that the Earth is not the centre of the universe, but the Sun, the Earth is a planet going round the Sun that we get from Copernicus. Galileo's thought experiments and mathematical insight into the way the world worked and, if you like, culminating in Isaac Newton, who in the... It, what's, what's the word, the, the word I want? The, um, he probably never sat up under an apple tree and saw an apple fall and thought, and fall and thought, Eureka, that's it. But there is this notion of uh, universal gravity, the universal force of gravity. So the same force that causes an apple to fall to the ground because the, the gravitational attraction of the earth makes it do that is the same force that is keeping the planets in their orbit around the sun. And that was a real conceptual breakthrough in Newton's Principia are rightly looked on as some of the most fundamental scientific writings that we've ever seen, both in terms of their scope. So we go all the way from the um, <coughs> the kind of the notions of uh, of uh, Aristotle uh, ca cataloguing what the Greeks thought about science through a long period until we get to the what we would now call the scientific revolution. And there are changes. So if Aristotle thinks that a cannonball fired will follow a trajectory up to a certain height and then will drop straight to Earth, the work of Galileo and Newton show that it won't do that. It will carry on in a path that makes it curve back towards the Earth, a path that we call a parabola. And particularly, Galileo is good at doing the kind of thought experiments that say, you know, if I drop a cannonball and a feather from off the leading tower of Pisa, they should both hit the ground at the same time because of gravity. Now, in reality, of course, the feather will flutter down because you've got the air resistance to stop that happening. But Galileo was doing, doing, doing these thought experiments which said, suppose you didn't have the air resistance there, what would these what would these bodies do? And so similarly, this kind of what we call a parabolic path of a, um, <coughs> of a cannonball is an approximation if you don't have to take into account the um, air resistance. But it's a, it's a different picture from Aristotle's where there are natural tendencies and things just go to where they really want to be. It's almost as if they're imbued with their own wills. The cannibal wants to be on the ground because it's an earthy solid subject. Whereas um, Galileo and Newton had this notion, some of you may have come across Newton's 
laws of motion, which is an object that travels in a straight line unless it's acted upon by a force or it stays at rest. And we get this notion of what I would call mechanical materials. And one of the features of mechanical materialism is you have a notion of matter, the cannonball, motion when it's flying through the air, and rest when it's not doing anything, when it's sitting next to the cannon waiting to be loaded in. And that was very important because in trying to sort of understand this um, path that a cannonball uh, would follow through the air, you had to imagine that you could take what is a continuous motion and you could break it up into individual instants, tiny, tiny, tiny instants in time, in which you could instantaneously say, what is the force on the cannonball due to gravity, and what is the motion that's been imparted to it by being fired out of the uh, out of the barrel of the cannon and how instantaneously are these two things working with one another to produce this parabolic path. In order to do that you really need to have a concept of the matter itself being at rest, hence matter, motion and rest. And in fact, there's a passage that, that uh, one of the sort of the leading scientific thinkers of the uh, late 17th century was Robert Boyle. And Robert Boyle gives his name to the gas laws that some of you might have come across in school. Um, but he wrote a book in which he debunked the alchemists called The Skeptical Chemist. And what he, it, what he um, showed was everything that they thought was a fundamental substance could be broken down into other substances so that they weren't fundamental. And Robert Boyle at the end of his book says, if you ask me what are the principles, I say they are matter, motion, and rest. So this notion that you've got matter, you've got it moving, but you can also have it fixed at rest. And that's a very good way of thinking about the world for almost everything that we come across in our daily life except this guy Einstein comes along in <coughs> 1905 now I'm going to introduce three equations to you but please don't get worried about that you're not used to equations and one of them E equals MC squared I guess if you ask most people in the street give me an equation E equals MC squared it's kind of a, it's a cultural icon now, just as Einstein himself with his big hair and shaggy appearance is a cultural icon. And you see these sorts of t-shirts with E equals MC squared on them, or variations on that theme that is supposed to be wicked. So that, that is the fundamental equation of relativity that Einstein introduced in 1905. Um, and that equation basically says that the amount of energy in a body, if you could totally destroy it, would be given by the mass of the body multiplied by the speed of light squared. So multiplied by the speed of light and by the speed of light again. So E equals mc squared. And I guess we all know that that's the equation that underlies <coughs> The nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and also is what's going on in the centre of the sun. So that's relativity. But Einstein, 1905 was a bit of a good year for Einstein because he also demonstrated something that had been in the air for a few years by then, which was another new theory that is less well known than relativity but deserves to be equally well known, which is quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics is why you've got mobile phones. You know, transistors, lasers, semiconductor components, it's all down to quantum mechanics. Um, 
And that equation says, well, if Einstein says energy is mass times the speed of light squared, the basic equation of quantum mechanics says energy equals a constant called Planck's constant after the person who first introduced it, German physicist, times the frequency of the light you happen to be looking at. And Einstein's equation E equals mc squared is a kind of equation of continuous things. And Planck's equation E equals h mu says that matter and energy at the very finest level are divided up into discrete bits. And that's an important concept. So you don't get a continuous amount of energy at a particular frequency, you get it in little packets that are called quanta. And that's a very fundamental uh, understanding. And the third thing Einstein did, <coughs> which I think is even more overlooked than his contribution to showing that quantum mechanics really work, he did this with something called the photoelectron effect, which is where beams of light kick electrons out of a, um, a, um, <coughs> a uh, metal surface. But the third thing he did was this. And this, it, uh, I don't know how well, can we lose some light, Jerry, just so that this uh, shows up a bit better. So this is what is called Brownian motion. Is Gordon Brown? No. <laughs> it predates Gordon Brown. Brown's a fairly, like Miller, Brown's a fairly, you know, <laughs> it's not all of us that can have these exotic names like Feldman. Uh, <laughs> it means a, a hat maker. You know. <laughs> right, anyway. Um, let's just, so you saw that little movie going. Um, and all of you have experienced uh, Brownian motion. If you draw the curtains a little bit and the sunlight streams in, you see dust particles flying around in the air in this kind of very, very random, random way. But what is on, this is um, pollen grains in a liquid. And you can see the way they're making all these little jerky movements and so on. But actually, what that shows is that underlying the pollen grains, which are actually quite big particles, are tiny particles of the liquid, atoms and molecules, that are themselves in motion and are kicking these little pollen grains around. And Einstein was able to demonstrate uh, that it was the movement of atoms and molecules in a liquid banging into these particles or in a gas banging into the particles of dust that were causing this effect called Brownian motion. So that was three key things in 1905. Um, absolutely fundamental uh, contributions to our understanding and to our understanding of actually a deeper um, level of matter than you could just get by looking at the way in which cannonballs moved after they'd been fired out of the cannon, or you know, everyday objects, large-scale objects um, uh, moved. And this gave rise to a different concept of... Um, I've still got a little movie. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this gave rise to a different concept, that you, instead of having these nice separations between matter on the one hand, motion as something that you imparted to matter, and rest as being matter in a state in the absence of any motion, you have a more dialectical way of thinking about the matter of the universe, which is matter in motion. And one of the key um, elaborators of quantum mechanics in the 1920s and 30s, a man called Paul uh, Dirac, a man who actually uh, predicted antimatter, who uh, laughed at Star Trek, um, he actually makes the point in him, his book that he's talking about the fundamental particles, atoms, molecules, electrons, protons, etc., that make up matter 
he makes the point that the state of no motion is the state of no particle. And we know that for molecules, even at a temperature of absolute zero, they still have something called the, the zero point energy. So no matter how much en energy, no matter how much motion you try to take out of matter, you never can do it entirely. There's always something. So, so we have this concept, not now of kind of a mechanical way of thinking about matter, but of a dialectical way of thinking about matter in which it's in continuous motion and change, etc. And I think some of the points that Paul was making about, you know, continuous motion and change. That doesn't in any way deny stability. And I'm going to say a bit more um, in um, a little while about opposites. So you might think that change and stability are opposites, but they're not. In fact, change comes out of stability because you have this uh, concept of matter being in continuous motion. So just uh, some of the things that came out of um, relativity. So the notion of a space-time continuum. So when they accelerate to warp speed, they are getting through the space-time continuum so that they can jump through hyperspace to different parts of the, the universe. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking about space and time because in, in this notion, actually space and time are much more interwoven and they are very dependent on the distribution of matter and motion. So the Earth gravitational field, which for Newton was just a point at the centre of the Earth acting on any other object in a kind of mysterious way, in relativity means that the kind of the, the space-time continuum is what we call the Earth. Um, we don't have to worry about it very much until we get into our cars and switch on the tom-tom. And general relativity has a sufficient effect that if you want to measure where you are on the Earth's surface to within a few metres, which is what things like tom-tom do, then you've got to take into account the effects of general relativity. But they are very subtle, they are very slight. They come into play when you've got enormous masses, such as you have with black holes. They come into play when you've got enormous distances. Um, so, the other question that quantum mechanics um, transformed their understanding about was, what was the nature of light? So, um, Newton, and you can see him there holding a prism, and, uh, breaking up light into component parts of the, the rainbow spectrum. He thought light was a, was a corpuscle or a particle, and it gave some very good arguments for that. Um, but later on, it was much easier to understand light if you thought of it as a wave, simply like a wave in the ocean because you could see why waves crept around ob objects like breakwaters and piers. If you see a wave breaking against a, a breakwater, you see it then sets off a, a lot of secondary little waves going around and it explains why, you know, incoming waves and outgoing waves sometimes combine together to form an enormous wave but sometimes they cancel one another out. So even when you spend the new time watching, watching the sea, um, watching ripples on a pond and this kind of thing. Um, so it seemed that particles and waves um, were opposite well. explanations um, and contradicted one, one, one another. And in fact, Einstein's work was to show that light did act like a particle. So a particle of light could kick another particle of matter, an electron, out of a metal surface. And then we got the um, notion from quantum mechanics that particles act like waves and waves like act like particles. And so dichotomy 
the dual nature of light that we thought was unbridgeable turns out to be a unity. Um, and that we actually get motion through quite contradictory processes. This is an experiment showing shining a light through two slits in a screen that are very close together. And you get this rather nice pattern because in the wave theory of light, um, you, you get waves coming together to reinforce each other, make the light brighter, and counteracting one another to give these dark spots. But if you can do that experiment now with such accuracy that you just allow one photon of light to go through either one of the two slits at a time. And if you do it photon by photon by photon by photon by photon, and you put a light sensitive detector at the edge of the screen, you will still get that pattern of light and dark, light and dark, light and dark. And how on earth does that happen if a corpuscle of light is going through a slit, one corpuscle at a time? It's either got to go through the top slit or the bottom slit. The answer is that it goes through, through both. So a photon of light at the point that you make this kind of experiment acts both as a particle. You can see the pattern building up photon by photon if you've got a scintillation counter. You can, you can measure it as you let them through. But the pattern that, are, that eventually um, uh, results is this wave pattern. So you have particles that are both particles and waves at the same time. And that's very important for understanding matter at this microscopic photon level, atomic level, molecular level, uh, subatomic particles, protons, electrons. So you've got a notion of contradiction and you've got a notion that these opposite explanations, contradictory explanations, are actually what lie behind our way of understanding matter in motion at the moment. So let me just take you through a whistle-stop tour of some cosmic evolution. And this is PJ's photograph of the Big Bang because he's out of the room now and I can say he's so old he goes all the way back to the start. start <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very unfair. So the, there, there is no photograph. <laughs> no cameras. So what do you get there? Well, in the very, very early universe, you have a mass of particles, positive and negative particles, and light. And so you've got a unity of things that you would normally think of being opposite. So plus and minus, you know, positive and negative electricity, you would think of those being opposite. Uh, north, south, north Pole and South Pole and May, you would think of those being opposite. But in this Big Bang, you've got this, this unity of positive and negative. And also, you've got a unity of um, <coughs> radiation and matter. And it's all kind of a... a, a, a a kind of a cosmic soup held together right at the very start of the universe. And then this unity also shows the way in which you have a conflict of opposites. So this is as far back as we can go. This is a photograph taken by the Planck uh, spacecraft named for Planck um, of what is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. So if there was a big bang then you would expect things to be hot and they were gazillions of degrees um, in our current measurements. <coughs> but at something like well, somewhere between 200,000 years 
and 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe had expanded. And just like um, your fridge works by having a gas go through a narrow jet and then expand and cool down, <coughs> an expanding universe is also a cooling universe. And you get down to a few hundred thousand degrees, maybe a few tens of thousands of degrees. And at that point, the unity of positive and negative becomes the formation of neutral atoms. So the first atom that forms is hydrogen. Sorry, the first atom that forms is helium, which is formed in, in the Big Bang, and then later hydrogen. And matter and radiation aren't completely mixed up anymore. The radiation is able to escape the clutches of, of the matter part of the universe. And we are able to see that as a, an image of what the universe looked like just 400,000 years after the Big Bang. That means we're going back on current reckoning, depending on whose numbers you take, well over 10 billion years you're going back perhaps as much as 13 and a half billion years. This photograph comes from. It's already interesting because what you see in there are some little fluctuations. This is effectively a temperature map. It's now the temperature of the Big Bang has cooled down so it's just, just under 3 degrees absolute. 2.73 plus or minus point zero 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 two. Have I got enough zeros in there? Yeah, I think I have. Um, of a degree. And those fluctuations are the plus or minus point zero zero two. And they show regions where the universe is cooler, there's a little bit more matter making it cooler. They're, they're the reddish regions and the bluish regions are where, or maybe the other way around actually, um, the bluish regions are the regions where um, it's cooler and the redder regions are where it's just a tiny little bit hotter, and less dense. And this unity conflict is what enables lumpy bits of matter to form. So the Big Bang should have been totally smooth, but at a certain level there had to be some little fluctuations in it. Because we know that matter in our universe is not thinly spread out like some workhouse gruel, but there are lumpy things in it. We are lumpy. The planet we are living on is lumpy. The solar system that we, our planet inhabits is lumpy. <coughs> so how do you get from something that's perfectly smooth right at the beginning to something that is lumpy, which is what what we've got at the moment. And those ripples are actually imprinted in the very uh, early fabric. So you've got a unity and a conflict of positive and negative, matter and radiation in the very structure of the early universe itself. And there is a, a certain interpenetration of opposites. Making stars is very difficult. It's incredibly difficult. So if I say that this image, that one is an artist's impression, this is a real image that comes from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. In order to make stars, we have to go for hundreds of millions of years, not hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of millions of years. Because there you are getting an interpenetration opposites happening. What is happening is that you probably all know that when something is heated it expands. Right? A gas that is being heated will expand. A liquid that is being heated will expand, although it's, it, you don't see it as clearly as a, as a gas expanding. And stars are hot, but they're made of gas. So you've got 
the opposites of gravity acting on some of these slightly <coughs> denser regions in the early universe, pulling matter together, trying to form stars. And as the gas is being pulled together, it's heating up. So it will try to push back against gravity. And it's a real conundrum, and it was a conundrum for quite some time, as to how you could form the very earliest stars. And it turns out that actually to form the earliest stars, um, you need to form not just neutral atoms, you need them to combine into molecules. And if anybody wanted to read about that, I have it in my book here, The Chemical Cosmos, a guided tour. But it is a very long, drawn-out process in which the opposites, if you like, of expansion due to gas heating, as you try to compress it, and gravity are fighting one another. Um, but in the very end, gravity does manage to win out. And matter condenses into dense enough lumps that at the very centre of this dense lump, you can bring atoms together close enough to start nuclear reactions going on. And you need a mass of gas the smallest mass of gas that will form a, a star in this way is about 8% of the mass of our sun. If you've got a bigger mass of gas, you can do it more easily. And the temperature you need to get up to is several tens of millions of degrees. So you've got this interpenetration of the opposites of expansion and contraction, Expansion due to heating, contraction due to gravity, leading to a transformation in which eventually you get a star. So my kind of take on this is that the, the history of our universe, even up to the point that you get the first stars, demonstrates the way in which opposites have to be united. You have to have positive and negative electricity in the early universe, otherwise you couldn't have it now. You have to have matter and radiation, light, heat, etc. in the universe, or you couldn't have it now. But these are in conflict with one another, and there is a period of them penetrating, being combined in one object, in the way you do in a mass of gas that is starting to form a star, that eventually leads to a transformation and we get nuclear burning, which is what is powering our sun today. So that if we look at our sun today, um, and <coughs> uh, this is a wonderful image. In fact, let's see if I can get us onto the, uh, the nice little, oops, here we go. Let's see if we can get this going. It has shed light on our home for over four billion years. It will continue to right. do so for another four. I mean, this just, these are X-ray and um, images of the way in which the surface of the sun is working. What you have is this ball of gas that has collapsed something like four and a half billion years ago, collapsed into a center, into a star, and is now, and the, these enormous loops that you can see here, they're tracing the sun's magnetic field, yeah. and you get also things that they call coronal mass ejections which are these amazing explosions of um, gas from the surface of, of the sun that can blast all the way to Earth. Uh, so these are just little explosions, but this one is an enormous coronal mass ejection, and that's the kind of thing that knocks out electricity systems and um, uh, power lines, satellites, etc., etc. So, this is a powerful 
set of laws that we've got. The matter in motion, the way in which opposites come together in a very violent, hostile, conflicting way, but nonetheless are, are able to penetrate and uh, transform one another um, as a process that is going on continuously. And we see it all over in astronomy. 